For the past few months, I've really been wanting to break off the traditional Blender tutorial course and do something a little bit more outside of the box. I came up with a seemingly endless list of ideas, but I really didn't like any of them. And that's when the idea popped into my head. Can I make my own motion capture studio? The answer? Yes. And so can you. It's really simple and relatively inexpensive. So what do you need to get started? Well, for one, you need a system to run it off of. This system by no means has to be top of the line, however there are a few important things that you have to take into mind. One, you need to have a USB 3.0 port with a controller made by either Intel or Renesa. If you have a different USB controller on your computer, it may not work. If you're unsure about whether your computer has this or not, I'd recommend googling some specs about your system to find out. Additionally, you'll need to make sure that your system's running Windows 10. This unfortunately does not work with any other operating system. Second, you're going to need to get your hands on a Kinect V2. They're currently going for about $45 on Amazon, and I don't expect that to change too much. You'll also need a Kinect adapter for Windows 10, which is more or less just a bundle of little boxes and cables that allow you to plug one thing into another. It's unfortunate that you have to have this, but it's also kind of necessary. It's currently going for just over $39 on Amazon, and again, I don't expect that to change much either. Additionally, having some sort of mounting device is really helpful for the Kinect because you can stick it on more things. I personally bought a little TV mount so I can just put it on top of my monitor when I'm using it. However, other people who are working in a more open area may want to invest in some sort of tripod because it does have a little quarter 20 screw mount on the bottom that you can screw into just about any piece of camera gear that you've ever had. The last thing you'll need is just an open space to work in, whether that be your garage or your living room, it doesn't really matter. As long as you have a few feet to move around, you're good to go. The total cost of all necessary parts is only about $85. Totally worth the money, especially when you get to mess around with it once it's done. As soon as these parts arrive on your doorstep, you're ready to get started. Just take them inside and start unpacking. Looks good to me. We'll start off with this little doohickey with no cables attached to it. It's great because it has a bunch of little symbols telling you where to plug things in. For example, connect over here, DC power down here, and USB up here. With this block as our centerpiece, we can go ahead and grab our connect and start plugging things in. Mine's all wound up, so I'll unwind it real quick. And once it's done, we can go ahead and set it down and plug in the cable connecting that into the connect side of the block. So we'll plug that in and set it back down. Additionally, if you have any sort of mounting bracket, I'd recommend putting that on now. They usually snap on pretty easily. Next up is our- oh, oh hello. Well, nice of you to stop by, Mr. Cat. Get out of here. Next up is our power supply box, which is the one with the cable with the power connector on the end. We can plug this into our main block and then put it off to the side. We can then take the USB type B side of our cable and plug it into our block, leaving the regular USB side off to the side so we can plug it into our computer later. Finally, we'll take our power adapter and plug that into the power box that we have over here on the left. Next, we can take the connect and put it somewhere where it's pointing at an open part of our room. It's also important to keep in mind that it has to reach a power outlet as well as your computer. It would also be nice if my pets would stop sabotaging my videos. Anyway, we can plug our power cable into the wall and our USB cable into a USB 3.0 port. From there, it's all on the computer. So we'll start by heading over to Microsoft's website and downloading the Connect for Windows SDK. There will be a link down in the description. All you have to do is click this continue button, check the yes box, click next, log into your Microsoft account. If you don't have one, you can create one at this screen as well. And when it loads, you can just hit the cancel button because otherwise it's going to sign you up for a bunch of different mailing lists that you don't want to be part of. And it should start downloading. While we're at it, let's also head over to ni-mate.com or nimate.com. Uh, this is the software we'll be using for the actual motion capture. So let's go ahead and click on the download tab, and then we can go ahead and download the Windows 64-bit version. While we're on this page, we also want to scroll down and download the Blender plugin right below it. We can start by running the Connect SDK installer first. This is by far the most important because it contains all the Connect drivers that you need to function. Installation is pretty straightforward. Once the progress bar is done, you can just click close in the lower right, and we're ready to move on to the testing phase. To test to see if our Connect is working, we can click the start button, type in Connect, and then we should have an option that says SDK Browser version 2.0. 
When we open this, we can see a bunch of different things that we can do with Connect and play with, but for now we're just going to run the Connect Configuration Verifier. This will run through a bunch of different checks to make sure it's working. All of the check marks should be green. Give it a few seconds though because sometimes it has to double check. As you can see, my USB controller isn't quite working, however, it's always been like this. This is still something that's heavily under development. I know that works for me though. If yours for some reason doesn't work, I'd strongly recommend researching a little bit more about your hardware and what could possibly be going wrong. So if everything is in shape, we can close out and have some fun. Press start, type in connect again, and open the Connect Studio version 2.0. Connect Studio is a fun way to play around with your connect. Up at the top, we have four tabs, monitor, record, play, and log, but we only care about monitor. Over here on the right, we have this big thing that looks kind of like a camera from Blender. Um, and if we click this little icon up in the upper left here, our Connect connects, and well, look at that. That's a 3D interpretation of where I am. And you can see that the skeleton is building around me. I can stand up, move around, and the skeleton follows me. It gets to be really fun to play with, just moving around and trying out different poses and watching this camera analyze you in real time. It gives you some insight as to how the Kinect actually works as well, which is something I've always wondered. We can also switch into 2D view up at the top, which kind of gives it more of a camera's interpretation of 3D space. We can also see how color mapping works with depth. For example, if I get too close to the camera, my hand becomes black. As I step back, it becomes red, and as I step all the way back, I become yellowish green. Now would also be a great time to open up the SDK browser again and look through some of the fun things to play with in here. For example, HD Face Basics allows you to track your face in real time, all your emotions, your mouth movements. It's, it's really weird, very uncanny, but it's, it's so much fun to play with. Another thing I'd recommend trying out is the Connect Fusion Explorer, which allows you to 3D scan pretty much whatever you throw at it. This might be a, another project further down the road. I guess we'll just have to see how this video does. Once you're done messing around with that, go ahead and install Delicode and iMate. Fortunately, the installer for this one's pretty straightforward as well, so you don't have to worry about it installing 8,000 random programs on your computer like some software is trying to. Whew, thank goodness. When you get this Connect for Windows runtime pop-up, click Cancel on it because we already installed that and we installed a more up-to-date version. However, the PrimeSense drivers you should install. For some reason, mine always fails the first time, but when it tries again, it works. I don't know why that happens, but you know, whatever. Anyway, we can click finish with the box still checked and the program should launch. Keep in mind that NIMate is not fully a free software. It's it's free and you can use as much as you like. It just has some limited features and that's what that's how I use it. That's how I've always used it and it works fine just that way for me. So when it actually starts, it launches in your system tray, which is weird. So if we just click it down here, oh, it ran away from me. Uh, if, we, if we click it down here, or right click it down here and click control interface, it pops this window up, which is where we can actually do what we need to do. So we can come down to the connect for windows tab and you can see that it is working already. Uh, it's using my connect right here. Uh, and we can see a live feed from that. If we come down to the output setting here and change it to 3D, we can actually get a 3D view of what we're working with. And now you can see that my skeleton is being portrayed in 3D space, which is awesome. If for some reason you don't have a grid floor or camera and your motions aren't popping up, click the start sensor button in the upper right. Mine says stop sensor right now. But when you click start sensor, that'll actually activate the connect and allow you to actually use it with the software. As soon as everything seems to be working properly, we can exit out of NIMate and we can install the Blender add-on. I'll go ahead and open up Blender. I'm using Blender 2.78, however, I have tested this in 2.79 and it works just fine. So don't worry, you won't have to downgrade. We can exit out of the splash screen, press Ctrl Alt U to open up our user preferences. If we're not in the add-ons tab, go there and click install from file at the bottom. Then navigate to wherever that add-on file is. For me, it's on my desktop. So I'll click it and then I'll click install from file in the upper right. I'll click the little checkbox next to it and I'll also click save user settings because that will enable the plugin every single time I start up Blender. So installing the add-on added this little tab to our tool menu over here with a bunch of settings and this magical little start button up here at the top is what's going to start our tracking. However, first we have to come back into NIMate really quick. Click this little drop down next to the connect for windows tab and check the box that says skeleton tracking. This will actually transfer the skeleton tracking data from NIMate into Blender. So now let's go ahead and delete everything in our main scene just to eliminate any confusion we might have. And then up at the top here we have this option that says create and then three or four different options. Nothing empties, spheres, and cubes. I'm going to set mine to empties and this means it'll create empties to represent me. 
I'll move my camera into a position to where I can see the whole grid plane on the ground there, and I'll click the start button and stand in front of my connect. And you can see, well, there I am. Now the issue is the camera's not really pointing at me, so I'm going to reach over and try and fix it here, but you can see my skeleton is absolutely glitching out. So now I'm, well, in Blender, represented by a bunch of empties, and you can see every single motion I make, whether it's walking forward or backward, moving my hands around, everything sticks. So this is also pretty fun to play around with, but it's still lacking any use. We need to be able to map these motions onto an actual armature. And how exactly do we do that? Well, NI8 comes with it built in. Well, more or less. You'll have to create a specialized rig to work just with NI8. But fortunately, you have me, and I already went through the pain and agony of trying to figure out how that works, and I made it available to you so you can download it and use it in your projects. You can either click the download link in the description or head over to my website, remingtongraphics.net. It's under the resources tab. Once you have the rig downloaded, we can go ahead and open it up. Upon opening it, we're presented with a bunch of information stacked on top of each other over here and a connect. So I actually have this separated out into layers down here. If we go to the first layer, we can see we have a bunch of different empties with different names. And these are actually the individual data points being transferred over by NIMate. If we go into NIMate and click on the Skeleton Tracking tab, we can actually see all these different names. That's essentially what I have here, except everything's an empty instead of just a name. On the second layer, we have a rig that transfers the data from these data points over to an actual rig. So you can see each bone has a constraint, for example here. This one will stretch from its origin point, the, which, which is the collarbone, to the left shoulder. In this case, this one stretches from the left shoulder to the left elbow. When we come over to the third layer, we actually have a retargeted rig. Now this isn't retargeted via the motion capture add-on that Blender has, it's actually retargeted manually because from my experience, retargeting doesn't really work in real time, so this is the best alternative to that, and it also works with pretty much anything you throw at it. So let's go ahead and actually give it a try. If this works properly, we should be able to take the data from random points into this rig and retarget it onto this rig. So when we click start, it should transfer the data, that is considering an iMate is open. So let's try it. Start, and I'll move into a position where my Kinect can see me, and there we go. So a little bit of glitchiness off the bat, but you can see that I am, well, moving around in Blender. As I lift my knees, you can see all the bones are working, my arms work just fine, and I should work with the torso as well. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed my brief motion capture performance. <laughs> if we switch to layer 2, which is the layer with the bones taking the data from the empties, we can see that this works as well. And the positioning of the empties themselves also works, so we'll do some jumping jacks to, to celebrate our victory. Alright, so we know that it works, but how do we actually map these movements onto our own rig? When creating your own rig, it's really important to keep it similar to the base rig that we had on layer 2. If you deviate too far from this base rig, a lot of bones may go to waste and the end result may not look as good as you hoped. So try and stick to that base concept and base rig. The simpler, the better. I always find it useful to move on to a new layer to work on your new rig. For my custom rig, I'm actually just going to use a human meta rig from the Rigify add-on. If you guys want to follow along step by step, you can enable this add-on too in Blender's user preferences. In the case of this rig, there are actually quite a few bones that we don't need. We don't need any of the fingers or parts of the feet, so we can actually go ahead and delete those. Just be careful not to delete any bones that you shouldn't. For example, the hand bone in the middle of all the fingers is essential for our rig to work. And there we go, we've removed all the unnecessary bones and saved just to make sure we don't lose our progress. Before moving on, we also need to check and make sure there are no unnecessary breaks in our model. For example, with this armature, there is a break between the shoulder and the upper arm bone. The fix for this is relatively simple. Just click on the little bone icon up on top here, and under the Relations tab, check the Connected box, and the bone will automatically connect itself. I'll do this for both. While recording this, I unfortunately didn't notice there's also another break in this rig between the shoulders and the neck. I ended up leaving it unconnected, however luckily the break in the bones didn't really affect the final result that much. However, if you do have breaks, I'd strongly recommend fixing them. Lower body breaks, such as the legs in this rig, don't really matter as much because they're a separate entity. One other thing I like to do before moving on is to enable the names for each individual bone so we can see them on this rig. 
I'll also hold shift and select the layer that our other rig, our copying rig or our base rig is on. And I'll also do the names for this as well so we can copy them easier without having to switch back and forth between the rigs. We'll start our manual retargeting process, as I like to call it, with the torso because it's the most important. So we'll select our tor- oh, I guess actually we should switch into pose mode. We'll select the base bone of our armature in order to do this. You know it's the base bone because if you press G and move it around, it should move the entire rig. If it doesn't, odds are you're selecting the wrong bone and you should try a different one. So with our base bone selected, we'll come over into the bone constraints tab over here, add a bone constraint, and add a copy rotation constraint. Select Capture Armature as the target, and then with our bone we want to select the bone that we're copying the rotation of, in this case the torso. Additionally we want to add a copy location constraint too, that way we can copy the location of the torso. So we'll select Capture Armature for our target and also the torso as the bone. I'm also going to move the copy location constraint on top of the rotation constraint just because that's, I don't know, it's not necessary however it's just a way for me to organize things. So I just zoomed out and I also noticed my armature is kind of having some trouble here. It's backwards. And yours might be backwards too. If it's not, it's fine. It's, it's fine the way it is. You don't need to change anything. But if it is backwards, either on the X or Y axis, you will need to make some small tweaks. Mine happens to be backwards on the Y axis. So I'll switch into edit mode, select all my bones, press S and then Y to scale on the Y axis, then press negative 1. This more or less inverts the armature and as you can see it now lines up properly, well kind of properly, with my base armature. So now we get to go through and add the constraints for each individual bone that can be posed. So this is the arms, head, neck, and legs. For each of these we'll add a copy rotation constraint with the capture armature as the target and whatever bone they're copying as the bone. For the case of a shoulder, it becomes a shoulder, so you can see the shoulder I guess actually the names are backwards here because I flipped it along the y-axis, but you can see the shoulder over the left shoulder in the position of where the left shoulder should be will copy the left shoulder. We'll do the same thing with the arm here and for the rest of the bones in our armature. So just go through and complete this process for the left and right arm, left and right leg, and also the neck and head. You can leave any extra chest bones untouched. The reason we don't want to touch these is because we have nothing to actually modify them. However, we can switch into the side view here and pose them so our armature isn't quite leaning back. Because it can be kind of unsightly. So I'm just going to rotate them upwards so our armature has a little bit more posture to it. After this, we're ready for our first test run. I'll click start to start transferring the data from our connect to blender. And when I move into the connect zone, you can see it works. Our custom rig is now working perfectly. It is a good idea to check every single bone and see how it moves. As you can see, that's what I'm doing here. I'm checking the motion of pretty much everything I can think of, and it seems to be working just fine. So what's the point of having a motion capture studio if you're not actually going to capture anything? First, we'll make sure we're in pose mode, and we'll select every single bone by pressing A twice. We'll click the auto keyframing button down on the bottom here, and we'll change the type to lock, rot, scale, location, rotation, scale and then we'll click start. Now to actually start recording you need to hit the play button. This process can be a little bit tricky if you're alone because you have nobody to click the button for you. What I like to do is move my mouse over the play button, pick it up, stand back, and then click when I'm ready to start recording. So now my actions are being recorded. To stop the recording just hit the pause button and then go back to your computer. As soon as you get back, and I cannot express this enough, make sure to click the red button down at the bottom again. That way you stop recording your keyframes. We can also stop the animate receiver. Now when we scrub back to the beginning of our video and hit play, we can see that the motion was indeed captured. We have our motions in 3D space on our rig doing what we want. If you made it this far, congratulations, you've actually just made your own motion capture studio at home using nothing but Blender and an Xbox Connect. Having your own motion capture studio at home opens up so many possibilities, whether that's just working on something for reference animation or creating an actual animation itself with nothing but motion capture footage. Now that you guys know how it's done, I'm gonna leave it up to you to be the creative ones and come up with a use for it. Anyway, that's all I have for this video. Thank you all for watching, and I wish you the best of luck in your endeavors. I'll see you guys later. Adios.